Hi, this is Robert Wright. One thing I like about the conversations I have here on The Wright Show is that they help me think and write. They've informed the books and many of the articles I've written over the past 15 years. Now, lately, most of my writing has been for my newsletter, the Non-Zero Newsletter. It covers the kinds of topics you see on the show. Politics, foreign policy, psychology, philosophy, spirituality, how to avoid the apocalypse, things like that. So if you enjoy The Right Show, chances are pretty good that you'll enjoy the newsletter. It's free, and all you have to do to get it is go to nonzero.org and sign up. So I suggest that you hit pause, go sign up, and then hit play. Thanks. Hi, Rutger. Hi there. Thanks for having me. My pleasure to have you. Uh, Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcasts. You are Rutger Bregman. Um, You are a Dutch. I'm tempted to introduce you as a thought leader, uh, Mm -hmm. because for one thing, and I've never introduced anybody that way before, uh, and I don't plan to make a habit of it, but I, I think in your case, it, it, uh, it's particularly apt. You're well known for kind of helping to put universal basic income on the map. In fact, you gave a famous TED talk about it that as I understand mm-hmm. it, Andrew Yang watched, got inspired by, and the rest is history. He became this one issue presidential candidate who's now well known for advocating UBI. Mm-hmm. So that's a thought you led. Um, it's not the main reason uh, we're talking today, although it's not unrelated to the main reason. The main reason is a book you've uh, just published called Humankind, A Hopeful History, uh, which presents us with a, a view of human nature that is somewhat sunnier than that held by some of us. Um, and that's the main thing we're going to talk about. Again, it is somewhat related to UBI, so I, I do want to talk about UBI before this is uh, before this is all over. Mm -hmm. But why don't we start with the book, and why don't um, you tell us a little bit about it? Well, I I thought it might actually be interesting to start with your observation about me being a thought leader. I don't blame you for wanting to dwell on that. If somebody called me a thought leader, I'd want to spend the whole hour on it, but No, but but I think it's a really interesting distinction, you know, that I think Dan Dressler wrote this book about thought leaders versus intellectuals. And I think that for him, being a thought leader is a little bit of an insult. Yeah, I actually did. uh, uh, People can Google me and Dan Dresner and they'll see that I did a podcast with him on that book. Oh, great. That's true. He was, uh, yeah, he was not happy with the culture of thought leaders. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, he has some really strong arguments, I think, that, you know, thought leaders tend to simplify things. They're really good at slogans and marketing their ideas. But maybe they're not really good at actually really thinking things through and just how difficult political change is, for example. Um, so I think he has some criticisms and maybe those are, you know, applied to my work as well. Uh, but then on the other hand, I mean, you could also sort of talk about the strength of thought leadership and maybe sometimes we actually need a little bit more of thought leadership in academia, for example, where, mm-hmm. you know, we actually have academics who are able to explain their ideas to a larger audience. And um, so I, I was. I think it's an interesting distinction, sort of the of either being a, a thought leader or an intellectual. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess yeah. There is this kind of new culture uh, that I mean, it, it, TED talks are almost at the center of it, at least in an iconic mm. way. I mean, I'm not mm-hmm. saying they're the prime mover of the phenomenon of thought leaders, but it's that's kind of the the hallmark of the thought leaders that they've delivered a, t- a TED talk, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And it's definitely something that's happened. Um, and and yeah, you're right. People uh, differ on whether it's good or bad. Now you are. I gather you have done. I mean, you, you consider yourself more journalist than an academic. You you have a master's degree in history, but you don't. You're not at a university, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I work at a journalism platform called The Correspondent, uh-huh. and I see it as a place you know, a little bit in between academia and a traditional newspaper. So we don't report on the news. Our slogan is "Unbreaking the News." Um, and we tend to focus on sort of the structural forces that govern our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I started working there when I was 25, 
And they basically said, you know what, here's a basic income, write about whatever you want. So I write around in normal times when I don't have to be, you know, promoting a book and saying the same thing over and over again. This is actually why I'm excited about this podcast, because we have a bit more time. Um, uh, so they gave me the freedom to basically write one essay a month, uh, just basically about anything. So I do have the freedom to go quite deep. So what usually what happens is that, for example like three or four or five months I'm deep into anthropology, but then I also make these big jumps and then go into sociology or psychology or, uh, mm -hmm. I spent, you know, for this book, I spent four months on the history and archeology span of Easter Island. Uh, so it's, I think sort of unusual place. I think we really lack these kind of institutions where people don't have to be so specialized as they have to be in academia, but they also don't have to, you know, focus on the news or anything mm -hmm. like that. So did you use that platform to put this book together? Was a lot of the work done there? Everything was done there. So uh. it was also written, I think, in a quite unusual way. All the chapters started out as essays on the correspondent. I, I write in Dutch, so the Netherlands is, is my little laboratory. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously you get a huge amount of feedback from our members. We are entirely member funded. You know, it's 100, we've got no ads. All, all of it is funded by members. And uh, they're great editors. So I, I, you know, for every chapter, I had like, uh, yeah, hundreds or m more than a thousand editors. And then, yeah, uh, after a couple of years, like three or four years, when I started writing the actual book, then you look at all the c feedback you, you, you've received. And then, uh, yeah, you lose some ideas and you try to improve others. Uh, yeah, is there, been, is there a, a in a way, it's been a collaborative. Is there a paywall? Could only, only subscribers could read the stuff or is it there for everybody? It's there for everybody. Okay. So uh, we sort of have a soft paywall. We try to annoy people who are not members yeah. and, uh, you know, talk to their conscience so and say, like, you should become like, one. <laughs> it's like the gu it's like the Guardian. You can get through yeah. that wall with a click or two, but yeah, you're going to have to go through it. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. If you treat your readers as sort of people who could join your movement or as possible members, then suddenly... You know, they are actually willing to pay money even though they don't get anything extra, right? They can mm -hmm. already read the thing. But that's what we always try to do is say, look, we're trying, trying to change something here. Join our movement. Uh, you know, let us make more of this kind of journalism. And that's been quite effective. And what, I mean, how do you define the movement? I mean, it's obviously broader than your own kind of uh, favorite issue, I guess, of, of UBI or the one you're mm -hmm. most associated with. Um, wh how does the correspondent writ large define its mission? The, wh hmm. What are people buying into as like community members? What what values hmm. are they subscribing to by virtue hmm. of? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. I think one of the m more important ideas of the founder, he's a philosopher named Rob Weinberg, has has been to say goodbye to the traditional idea of objectivity. That hmm. ob objectivity is just about you know, he said, she said. We are just giving the facts, trying to be neutral as a journalist. I think he has big philosophical issues with that. He thinks it's absolutely impossible and that often, often objectivity is just another word for the status quo or, you know, uh, uh -huh. uh, choosing the side of those in power. So I guess what we try to do is to be explicitly subjective and to be clear and open about where we come from. And, um, yeah, then also open about when we change our, change our mind and to go on this, journey that you could call a learning curve where you start working as a journalist and you say okay i'm going to write about this you ask the community you know what what do you think i should look at what's your knowledge what's your expertise and then you start this conversation so we see the relationship with readers not as uh the expert that's just sending information but as kind of a conversation leader mm -hmm. uh, that's the idea and that's also how i tried to write this book okay so let's talk about the book um yeah the so what what view of human nature are you arguing against, I guess, is one way to start out. Mm -hmm. um, the primatologist Franz de Waal has this concept of veneer theory. And he's not an advocate of veneer theory himself. He just describes it as something that he sees among other scientists or, or in mm -hmm. history. And here you have the notion that our civilization is only a thin veneer and that... Uh, you know, when there's a small change in our circumstances or when we're given the opportunity or when we're in a crisis like a natural disaster or a pandemic, that people reveal who they really are. That deep down we're just selfish, we're animals, we're savages, we're monsters. Um, 
And this is what, yeah, what he calls veneer theory. So I think a big part of my book is devoted to debunking veneer theory and to mm -hmm. showing that actually, uh, yeah, our civilization is not just a thin layer, but at the core of who we are is something that, well, we're clearly not angels. We're not good. That's not what I'm advocating. But we have evolved in many ways to cooperate and to be friendly and to, and to work together. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that's one of the central ideas that I try to yeah. talk about. Yeah, I actually know Franz. I actually once saw him in the Netherlands. Uh, and, um, I think that may have been the last time I saw him. And, 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 and I should say I'm, I'm a little, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I guess myself associated uh, vaguely with uh, the thing he's generally associated with, I mean, which is to say an evolutionary view of human nature. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a book a long time ago, kind of the dawn of evolutionary psychology called The Moral Animal. And mm -hmm. you're right, Franz, I, I think within the, within the field, Franz is thought of as emphasizing the sunnier side of human nature. And he, he, he uses the term veneer theory. Um, in a, uh, not altogether flattering way. And there certainly yeah. have been veneer theorists. I think of Freud as being one, you know, he, uh, you know, who kind of, who, his idea was we, we're animals and then civilization showed up. And, and so we, mm -hmm. we pretend we're civilized, but we're, we're animals. I mean, I, I would say though that in evolutionary psychology, it seems to me there has been for some time an emphasis on the cooperative side. Mm -hmm. Of human nature, right? I mean, it's not, um, so that idea in and of its, and, and in fact, I think one of the contributions of evolutionary psychology is to explain the mechanisms through which cooperation could have evolved. At the same time, the cooperation is conditional and, mm -hmm. and the field also emphasizes the capacity of people to be quite the opposite of, mm -hmm. uh, cooperative and, and, and depicts both of those sides of human nature as being, in some sense, innate. That is to say, uh, you know, when um, when the monster in us comes out, uh, that that's uh, it didn't just show up out of nowhere. That's a human capacity designed yeah. into us by natural selection. Now, um, do you do you take issue with that view? That as I've just described it, that that there's really these. You know, sometimes we're nice, sometimes we're not. We're designed to be sometimes nice and sometimes not. But hmm. designed in hmm. quotes I, because I'm talking about natural selection, not a real uh, designer. But um, you take my mm -hmm. point, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, you have to recognize that on the one hand, we may be one of the friendliest species in the animal kingdom. You know, Brian Hare, the evolutionary anthropologist, literally talks about survival of the friendliest. That actually the friendliest among us had the most kids and so had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. And then there's obviously the discussion about what the, the main selection mechanism here was, right? Richard Rangham says that it was, uh, you know, capital punishment that was so important here. Yeah, R uh, Richard, I would say, has a, is on the darker side of the yeah, spectrum exactly. of views yeah. of human nature within the, <laughs> within the field. Yeah. 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 But he has evolved himself a little bit, right? Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. I, like, I did a podcast uh, with him and I encourage people to listen to it. It was a, it, it, he had a, uh, in some ways, radical but very interesting hypothesis about the role of violence. Yeah. In the, he, he has this idea that uh, not infrequently people ganged up and killed like the biggest asshole in the yeah. hunter gatherer village, and, and that 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 is shaped. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I digress. But 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 yeah. uh, but go ahead. And I think that's a really, really interesting hypothesis that I talk about in the book as well. I just think that it's probably not the only and maybe not even the most important selection mechanism here. It could also just be the case that if you live in a more egalitarian society that, you know, just nice guys finish first, that they have more friends. And if you have more friends in a very tough environment, say in the Ice Age, that you just have a higher chance of surviving and that maybe women also like uh, prefer for the nice guys. Um, so I can you know come up with an explanation that doesn't involve capital punishment that still gets sure. you this domestication and um uh, gets you this process of survival of the friendliest but you know actually the reason i wrote this book is exactly because of this development in evolutionary anthropology that you know we have seen a shift to um i, I think a bit more hopeful view of human nature at one point while i was researching the book i was talking to a uh, psychologist called marie lindegaard she's a danish Dutch psychologist uh, working in Amsterdam 
she's just published a very interesting paper together with her colleagues about the bystander effect uh, published in American Psychologist. For decades, psychologists believe that um, you know, when there's a local emergency, someone's drowning or someone's attacked in the street, that if there are a lot of people watching, then, you know, the chance that someone will actually help is, is get smaller and smaller. Uh, because people are like, you know, it's not my responsibility. Someone mm-hmm. else can do this. Uh, the bystander effect. We've known about it since the 1960s with the famous homicide of Kitty Genovese, you know, right. the story. It was written up in the New York Times. Doubts have been exactly. raised about that account. Yeah, exactly. as you, yeah. yeah, but it still ended up in all the textbooks of psychology students around. Not the world. only that, and, by the way, but just to show you what an unjust society we live in, um, <laughs> notwithstanding <laughs> some in retrospect possible deficiencies in the story, the guy who wrote it, Abe Rosenthal, later became the editor of the New York Times. I digress. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, so what what happened is that I was talking to her about her research into the bystander effect. She's built this database of real incidents that were filmed by CCTV because, I mean, we've got cameras everywhere these days. So why do we have to rely on these laboratory experiments where, you know, there's some kind of theater set up by a researcher? We can just look at what happens with real people in real life. So she spilled this database and she discovered that actually in 90% of all cases, people help each other. And the more people see something happening, the higher the chances that you will be helped. There's mm-hmm. like a reverse bystander effect. People find support in each other. So... Yeah, it's a very, I think a very powerful paper that basically meant that we could throw away, you know, decades of, of work on the, on the bystander effect. Um, I was talking to her about this research and then, you know, after the interview, I said, you know, I just spoke to Franz de Waal and I've got a chapter in my book about evolutionary anthropology as well. And then she said to me, Oh my God. So it's happening there as well. Uh, and that then, then I meaning, thought, oh, meaning well, what, meaning what by that? What did she mean? The exactly? shift. The shift from a more cynical view of humanity to a more hopeful view or a bit more optimistic. Um, and then I thought, hey, maybe this is a book. Maybe sort of you can put this all together. Maybe something is happening in different fields at the same time. Is that, and that because there are a few generalists left these days because, you know, all these brilliant specialists, they're so specialized in their own field that they may not notice what's going mm-hmm. on in a field next to theirs. So that's my attempt, basically, in this book, to bring that research together and to show that something bigger is going on. Yeah. yeah. No, I certainly agree. There is this – we have this wonderful, uh, I think, built-in um, ability to be nice under all kinds of circumstances and even to make um, – you know, in situations where you don't know a person, to make a kind of a tentative overture and hope mm-hmm. that, that things can work out and there can be a, a friendship. I mean, you're, you're of course familiar with all the, the kind of tit for tat game theory work on mm-hmm. the evolution of cooperation. They've actually mm-hmm. shown that cooperation, uh, through computer simulation, uh, can be a very, uh, effective strategy and that helps explain why the emotions governing, um, friendship could could have evolved in in principle you know which mm-hmm. in, which range from uh things like just uh you know affection for a friend to things like gratitude um but but evolutionary psychologists would say would also include uh you know a kind of a reciprocation unconscious reciprocation monitoring system so that if your friends seem to be taking advantage of you uh, you know, you get mad at them, and so, the, the, uh, and if they take too much advantage of you, you turn on them. So, I, mm-hmm. I guess in evolutionary psychology, there's always there's always another side, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you if you if you take my point, now is that consistent with your worldview that that in other words that we're kind of guarded, uh, mm-hmm. altruists, and uh, and we're capable of. Uh, more than capable of withdrawing the altruism and even punishing mm-hmm. people if things aren't working out, then that's part of human nature. Well, one of the challenges that you have to deal with when you write a book like this about human kindness and survival of the friendliest and you name it, is that you know that people are going to ask you the question, yeah, but what about the Holocaust? What about ethnic cleansing and genocide and wars? And I mean, you can you can also clearly argue that we're not only the friendliest, but maybe also the cruelest species in the whole animal kingdom. We do all kinds of horrible stuff that... You know, uh, penguins would would never think of doing. Um, so, how do you explain that? Um, I've got a I've got a part in my book that about the psychology of of violence. Already, when I was a student, I read this book by Randall Collins, and I'm not sure if you know him. Uh, he's a sociologist. Wrote a book uh, 
I think it's just called violence and micro sociological theory. It's, it's really one of the best works I've read on it. And in that book over and over, he makes the point that actually, even though we're capable of it, we find it quite difficult. So with eating food, it's clear to everyone that it's good for you and we enjoy it most of the time. With sex, it's the same. And it's also clear to come up with the evolutionary reason why food and sex are good for us and why they feel good, right? Because otherwise mm-hmm. we would go, we would die. But with violence, it's actually interesting is that we find it quite hard. Uh, often, you know, if you look at the, if you, if you look at the history of warfare, uh, you can actually uh, find some really strong evidence that many soldiers throughout uh, many wars, especially if they've just been drafted, you know, and not been conditioned and, and and had a rigorous training, that they find it hard to actually fire their guns and, and to become violent. And then if they do manage to to kill someone else, they come back and they're traumatized. They have PTSD, which suggests to me that even though we're capable of this pretty horrible and nasty behavior, maybe we're not sort of born to do it. I mean, there's no, no, no clear psychological advantage to us there. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it only becomes more difficult to explain, obviously. And that's why in a book like this, you have to go on for hundreds and hundreds of pages about, you know, the, the dark mm-hmm. chapters in our history. But it suggests to me that, um, yeah, maybe we're not sort of, we're not killer apes. Let's put it like that. Yeah. Well, certainly war per se can't come very naturally to us, just in the sense that, large-scale organized violence could not have been part of the hunter-gatherer environment in which presumably almost all of human evolution took place. So so it's like an unnatural thing when some government, which itself is an unnatural thing, you know, mm-hmm. um, convinces you to go over and kill somebody you've never met. I mean, mm-hmm. as Muhammad Ali famously put it, I ain't got nothing against no Viet Cong. I mean, I would think that should be your default attitude toward people mm-hmm. in another country you've never met. And, and I think that's why we see these elaborate, uh, you know, really propaganda campaigns preceding wars. I mean, it's like I was like against the Iraq war and it was just like watching a slow motion nightmare unfold to, to see how people became convinced that we really had to do this. Mm-hmm. And like, and, and at the same time, you know, it seemed to me that the psychological mechanisms that were being activated mm-hmm. are these time honored psychological mechanisms that when wars have been organized, have been successfully activated again and again and again. I just think they're part of human yes. nature. Like if you can convince people this guy is a threat or this group of people is a threat, mm-hmm. um, something changes in their minds that in a way is disturbingly subtle, right? Yeah. Because because it isn't just rage. It's like uh, these cognitive biases get triggered. This The whole way they're filtering information about this uh, become biased in a way that sustains the drive toward war. So I would certainly agree that war is not natural. At the same time, it seems to me the the psychological mechanisms that facilitate it mm-hmm. um, are are natural and, and and have their and and presumably have their foundation in the fact that although killer apes may not be the way I'd put it. Violence of a, of a, on a smaller scale Mm -hmm. probably was part of human evolution. But anyway, how how do you react? How do you react to that? Yeah. Oh, there's so much to say about this. So in the book, I make the case that we can see war as a kind of mismatch, you know, mismatch one of the, uh, you know, much more about this than I do probably. But, you know, one of the important ideas of evolutionary anthropology that because we live 95% of our existence as hunter gatherers, that maybe there's a mismatch between sort of our bodies, the way we've been evolved, and our modern society. And that's that's the case I make, that the moment we settled down, we became a sedentary species, we invented property, we uh, became farmers and city dwellers, that that is also the moment where you see clear and striking evidence for the, the beginning of warfare. Uh, both in, if you look at the evidence we have from anthropology, you compare hunter-gatherer tribes from around the globe, or if you look at the archaeology of war. I actually... Um, there's a big discussion, you know, in science about this. You have people on the one hand, you know, the Steven Pinkers of this world who really say that war has been with us since the beginning, that even nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes tended to, 
you know, mm-hmm. team up and, and be very, uh, very violent against each other. I think that the evidence for that is very, very weak. I have a discussion in my book about, you know, the evidence that uh, Pinker brings to the table in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And I really like that book. But I think the parts about nomadic and togetherers are really, really weak and very a bit sloppy. Um, I was more convinced by the work of people like Douglas Fry and Brian Ferguson, who uh, emphasized that, yeah, if you want to know something about like the, the way we live for the biggest part of our history, you really have to look at the right in the anthropological record. You have to look at the right tribes, right? Not those who've already domesticated horses, already have become farmers or, you know, already have become sedentary because we know these are relatively recent phenomena. Um, and if you then look at the archaeological record, well, there's almost nothing. There really is almost nothing. Even if you look at cave paintings, if there was really some kind of war of all against all going on in our deep past, then you would suspect that some Picasso from the Stone Age would have made a nice Guernica out of it, right? And we've got lots of cave paintings from that time, but no depictions of warfare uh, between people. Um, so I think that uh, Brian, someone like Brian Ferguson is right when he writes that war had a beginning. Uh, and obviously, uh, yes, I mean, human beings are such an extraordinarily flexible species. So some people may, uh, make you know, the criticism, what does it mean to talk about human nature anyway? Because we can be so many different mm-hmm. beings in different circumstances. Um uh, but I think it's important to uh, to understand where we've come from, to bu- to try and build a, 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 a realistic as possible, as much realism as possible in your view of human nature, because that matters when you d- you design the, the institutions for today. Yeah, the um, I mean, I'd say a couple of things. If if, mm-hmm. if people want to see, read an argument that there is a certain amount of archaeological evidence of kind of prehistorical organized violence. There's a book by Lawrence Keeley called War Before Civilization where he amasses some of this evidence. I mean, I'm not fit to really judge that argument. I, I would mm-hmm. I would say the um on the on the on the question of kind of observed hunter gatherers, I mean you're 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 right that we don't have that many um well, there are a lot of hunter gatherer societies that have been studied that are on the anthropological record. Uh, and in a way, some of the most interesting are from like a hundred years ago because some of them were observed before modernity had so encroached on them. Uh, mm-hmm. but you're certainly right that if they've got like agriculture or something or domesticated animals, then they're not strictly speaking hunter gatherer yeah. societies. Yeah. I, 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 um, and you know, uh, I recognize, I recognize that it's very hard, obviously, to know how our ancestors lived. 20 yeah. to 30,000 years ago. I mean, the evidence we have is very thin. But what I am trying to show in my book is that what we have points in in a bit more optimistic and hopeful direction than we've been taught for a very long time. And I think there's mm-hmm. also this tendency in science journalism that whenever there is, you know, a new finding of, you know, some new grave or something like that. We recently had this finding in Naturuk, is it, is it called? You know, then immediately we've got the headlines everywhere. Oh, human beings are killer apes after all, the deep roots of violence, blah, blah, blah. But then when later, you know, there's criticism of the finding or, you know, it's, it's the same with, with, with journalism in general. No news is, or good news is no news. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I really think that there's, um, there's need for some correction there. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I'd say on Hunter Gathers before we maybe get back to contemporary matters is that mm-hmm. um, the view that uh, the kind of uh, kind of cognitive and affective biases that sustain organized violence are natural in the sense of mm-hmm. being built into us by natural selection doesn't depend only on a scenario where there's a lot of organized violence between like different hunter gatherer groups, like different villages or different, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's also the idea that within a given, you know, if you've got like a village of a hundred or 200 people, you're going to have disagreements uh, between groups, between coalitions, Mm -hmm. Uh, and they may sometimes turn violent. And and even if they don't, you know, a a fair amount of time, the violence doesn't lead to death. It's just a way of, like, making a point. Like, no, you can't, like, steal my mate, or you can't, you know, do this or that, Mm -hmm. and my friends are going to back me up. Uh, uh, 
so and, and 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 one idea is that even that degree of violence violence that's sometimes fatal often not and happens within the society could over time if if prevailing in these disputes is correlated with reproductive success and you can imagine how it could be um then uh that dynamic alone could give rise to the kinds of uh biases that are that are commandeered uh, for mm-hmm. purposes of organizing modern war, so I would just mm-hmm. I would just just throw that out as kind of a, a footnote. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but then I would say that the, I mean, one of the most exciting developments I think in evolutionary anthropology has been this, you know, this new theory, this new idea of self domestication, the notion that we are well, I, I like to call it Homo puppy that we've puppified uh, in our evolutionary history. Uh, that there's been this selection of the friendliest that goes very much against, you know, what some of the the, the big thinkers have been saying uh, uh, earlier, like Napoleon Ch- uh, Chagnon. Do Chagnon, I pronounce his yeah. name cor- correctly? I, I think he um, pronounces it Chagnon. But but yeah. um, yeah, he studied the Yanomamo, who were um, I forget. I think they had a little domestication. May not have been uh, purely hunter gatherer, but they were. As I think he put it, pristine, relatively pristine in the sense that they had had very little contact with modernity when he studied mm-hmm. them. And they did, and, and, and he did work, uh, about groups of males, uh, killing other males, taking their women, stuff like that, uh, mm-hmm. and, and arguing that there was, uh, either, a, uh, I think a demonstrated or a plausible correlation with reproductive success. Anyway, well, that, that's his work. What were you going to say about? Him, yeah. Well, he's been strongly criticized for that work. So again, I think it's Brian Ferguson here who's done a quite effective demolition job, where he just shows some of the mathematical errors in uh, in Chagnon's work. Um, so if I remember correctly, uh, I think he he only looked at the survivors, only included uh, the survivors in his database, which is obviously quite a bit of a mistake because if you kill someone else, then well, sometimes you have to deal with revenge and you die. But then you have to include those people in the database as well, obviously, because otherwise it would be arguing that, you know, it's very smart to win the lottery if you're only looking at the winners, right? Um, so uh, I think that's been a really uh, powerful criticism of that work. And it's also interesting to note that actually, you know, the work of people like uh, Brian Hare and there are, there are others who've worked on the self-domestication theory goes in exactly the opposite direction, which is really to show that, yeah, we, we have domesticated ourselves. And that can only happen if there's been a selection for pro-social behavior, for friendliness. Uh, ju- just as what we did with, you know, uh, dogs and sheep and, and cows, you know, where it was actually the tamest who had the most... Uh, kids and so uh, they got the domestication syndrome smaller brains thinner bones and just looking more pedomorphic but more childish and that's exactly what you see in our own um uh evolutionary uh, record you compare skeletons from 50 40 30 20 10,000 years ago and you see this domestication you see this selection for yeah pro-social friendly be- behavior that is associated with domestication. So I'm not saying that, you know, this is all watertight. There's, there's yeah. probably a lot more debate to be done about this, but I think it's, uh, it's really exciting and interesting that it goes in a very different direction than, you know, the, the theories of the sixties and the seventies when we were talking about human beings as killer apes. Well, I mean, I, quickly on Shagnon, I'm not up on the debate over the uh, quantitative methodology. His mm-hmm. book on, his original book on Yanomamo is worth reading. I, I think if only for the sheerly descriptive part, there there mm-hmm. clearly is a certain amount uh, of violence that is, uh, you know, overtly associated with reproduction in, in mm-hmm. the sense that it, it's it's about, um, uh, you know, it, it involves, uh, you know, access to mates and so on. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't know about the methodological study. Now, on the on the thing about the 60s and the 70s, Mm-hmm. You know, I'd be careful because the theory of reciprocal altruism emerged in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, it had been articulated in George Williams's book in the late 60s. Uh, the, the, the famous articulator of it in the early 70s is Robert Trivers. Mm-hmm. And that remains to this day, I think, the explanation 
for things like uh, friendship, uh, organized cooperation on on a you know on a group uh, scale. I, I mean, there is within evolutionary psychology there. You know, there's a, I won't get into it between individual selectionists and group selectionists. So some group selectionists would say that Trevor's work really needs to be supplemented in a big way. But, mm-hmm. but the point is, I mean, uh, you know, and then Robert Axelrod did this book, The Evolution of Cooperation, with a computer simulation, uh, uh, which I think came out uh, by, I don't know, 1980 or so. So I really, you know, th- this is not, this part I, I, I just don't think is, is so new, and I don't think it constitutes a kind of revision of evolutionary psychology. Hmm. It's just that Trivers, in, you know, emphasized from the beginning that there has to be what you might, I don't know if you want to call it a darker side, but but just as, uh, you know, fellow feeling and affection and gratitude are part of mm-hmm. the dynamics that would naturally evolve, so are things like a sense of grievance Mm -hmm. and and even a sense of justice in the in the in the sense of um i mean sense of justice a little more complicated but i would say it has its roots in some sense in a reciprocal dynamic and and that's that's this intuition that good deeds should be punished uh good deeds should be rewarded bad deeds should be punished that if Mm -hmm. you and this is so important to me because i think it is a widespread human intuition uh that we never examine the idea that if someone does something good they deserve to be rewarded, and if somebody does something bad, they deserve to be punished. Mm-hmm. It, it's an intuition uh, about what justice is, and it has, I think it has its pros and its cons in everyday mm-hmm. human society, and some of the cons emerge from the fact that uh, arguably we're designed to process the evidence in a biased way, right? It's like mm-hmm. when I'm deciding... Uh, who has, who's been good to me and who's been bad to me and how good and bad they've been, uh, I may be biased in doing that. And, and, mm-hmm. and that warps everything. I mean, I, I'm saying more than I should say in a single spiel yeah. here, but, but my point <laughs> is, I don't, I don't think this is so new. If, if the idea is that we can have, that the good stuff could have evolved without the kind of stuff that complicates the picture, that is mm-hmm. new because because mm-hmm. I think evolutionary psychologists were from the beginning attentive to the fact that ultimately evolution is about which, uh, you know, which genes get into the next generation. And when you think yeah. about how that works, it just can't be that it's all kumbaya. No, no, no. It's interesting. I think that, you know, if you read the first editions of The Selfish Genes from Richard Dawkins, Who's, I mean, that was also the same period. Um, in the first editions, there was a line that said something like, let's teach our kids altruism and generosity because they are born selfish. And later he removed that sentence from the book and he said, you know, it was stupid of me, of mine, you know, that actually doesn't, didn't come out of the, of, of yeah. that theory. And, um, so I think there's been a little bit of a shift there. It's, I think it's also interesting that, uh, for example, if you look at, uh, some psychological work that has been done on altruistic behavior with children. In my book, I talk, for example, about Felix Warnikin's work, uh, where he shows that kids at a very young age, like two, three years old, uh, just like to help uh, even strangers who, you know, mm-hmm. have a bit of a problem. And that somehow this can be a revolutionary finding that, you know, he, he gets to publish these kind of papers in high profile journals. And I think that for many parents around the globe, that's sort of funny to hear that this is revolutionary because they, they often have seen it. They've seen it many times in their, in their lives. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree that, uh, in science, something rarely is like totally new, but I think you can argue that there's been both in biology and anthropology and psychology, uh, quite a bit of a shift to emphasizing like more the, the cooperative and, and sort of the ni- the better angels of our nature. Um, yeah, although, as you noted, the, the person who titled the book after that, Steve Pinker, doesn't, mm-hmm. uh, you know, entirely share <laughs> your worldview, right? I mean, but True. Uh, so he, he is emphasizing, you know, both sides. I, I agree that that for Richard Dawkins to have said that in the book was stupid in part because 
it further confuses people about what the title of the book means. The mm-hmm. idea of the selfish gene, one of the things the book showed, it wasn't original to him. It, it was a work of popularization, and it drew on the mm-hmm. work of people like Bob Trivers and William Hamilton. But what it showed was that, quote, selfishness at the level of the gene, by which he didn't mean conscious selfishness, but still – uh, uh, mm-hmm. things that are good at getting the individual genes into the next generation actually can be altruistic at the level of the individual. So yeah, so exactly. love yeah. of siblings is yeah. selfish from the point of view of the genes. Friendship is selfish from the point of view of the genes. Yeah. It, that idea was clear even in that book, in the work that in, that he was drawing on, and you're right that he's muddying the waters if he yeah. starts depicting the view as fundamentally one that emphasizes human selfishness, I, mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, I always find it a, a, a bit funny is that, you know, you have this very long debate in in both psychology and philosophy, whether there are genuine altruistic acts. There's this anecdote of Thomas Hobbes walking down the streets with a friend and uh, he gives some money to a beggar. And then the, the friend says to Thomas Hobbes, hey. Wait a minute. You believe that all people are deep down just selfish, right? So, uh, and now you're giving money to a beggar. That clearly can't be true. And then Thomas Hobbes says, yeah, but it just gives me a good feeling. So it's still selfish after all. And mm. then you have this very long debate about are there genuinely altruistic acts? You know, maybe we can show this in some kind of laboratory experiment or, you know, if we think about it hard enough. And to be honest, I think that whole debate is a little, a little bit stupid because imagine that we would live in a world where every time you would help someone else, you would get this nauseous feeling. I mean, that would be a definition of hell, right? That would be quite horrible. Yeah. You give some money to a beggar and you start vomiting. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that would be very no. altruistic then, yeah. But I wouldn't want to live in that world. No, and, and, we're, and the good news is we are actually <laughs> built to feel good about yeah. our own generosity. I, I, yeah, I agree. Exactly. I think that's part of human nature. In fact, it's yeah. interesting that if you pay attention when you... Um, uh, Like, if you come across a homeless person, Mm -hmm. like, as a practical matter, if you're in certain cities, you pretty much have to not make a habit of helping them all. They're, like, everywhere. Mm -hmm. But you you may notice that it's it's – I find it very hard when I'm not going to help them, not going to give them money, to make eye contact with them. That's Mm -hmm. a difficult thing Mm -hmm. to do. It's easier to look away, and I suspect that that's part of – human nature that again can be uh, explained by the, the theory of re- reciprocal altruism um, mm-hmm. in ways I won't go into but I I, I, I I think that's it's good news it's good news that we feel good about being good and yeah. I think th- I think yeah. that's built in I just think I, I guess maybe my my a big part of my question is why why is it good to emphasize the sunny part as opposed to the less sunny part. I can come up with examples Mm -hmm. when I think people really need to be schooled Mm -hmm. in in, in the dark side of human nature to understand what's going on in their own brains, and I can get into that. But but why Mm -hmm. don't you first tell us what disservice you think is done by emphasizing Mm -hmm. the dark side of human nature and Mm -hmm. what what good comes from emphasizing Mm -hmm. the sunny side? Okay, so let me first say what I'm not arguing. I think it would actually be dangerous if people say that people are fundamentally good or that we're angels and that we're only corrupted by society and that we just have to get rid of, I don't know, a lot of institutions and those in power and then we can just live happily ever after and this is wonderful. We're clearly not, right? We're not angels. We're capable of pretty horrible things. Power tends to corrupt. Uh, we can be very cruel in certain circumstances. So that's important. It's also important to emphasize, as someone like Steven Pinker has done, that we're not blank slates. So you can't do everything with people, right? There, there is, There are things that are really are within our nature and you have to recognize them and deal with them. Um, what I am saying, though, is that our view of human nature tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you assume in other people is often what you get out of them. Uh, There's some wonderful evidence here from uh, economics. Robert Frank, the economist, uh, already in the, I think, the second half of the 90s, he did these studies with his students where, you know, he, uh, like a simple test where he sort of tried to see how generous they were. Uh, And um, turns out that as they progress in their studies and they learn more about yeah, neoclassical economics and homo economicus, they start behaving more like homo economicus and they become mm. less generous. So in, in Frank's words, we become what we teach and, and what we learn. 
Um, so I think there can be um, a real beneficial side to actually emphasizing the better angels of our nature and emphasizing our capacity for goodness and decency. Um, and so often, actually, in the last couple of decades, we've done the opposite. I think you can really make the case that so many of our institutions, our workplaces, our democracies, our schools, are often grounded in the idea that people are just selfish and that we live in this kind of Lord of the Flies world. And obviously, there's a... Um, there's a real political side to this as well. And that's, I think, also why these debates about human nature or debates about nomadic and togetherers 50,000 years ago tend to be so controversial because there's a lot at stake. If it's really true that, um, yeah, people are just selfish, then we need those in power, then we need hierarchy, then we need a Leviathan to keep us in check. If Rousseau was more on the right side of the argument. If actually maybe people are pretty decent, if they can trust each other, then maybe we can move to a much more egalitarian society, a much more genuine, genuine democratic society. And this is, I think, the reason why those who have advocated a more hopeful view of human nature have often been persecuted, you know, starting with people like uh, Kropotkin, you know, the anarchist, sort of the, the first, uh, sort of the great, great intellectual grandfather of Franz de Waal, who already at the beginning of the 20th century wrote about mutual aid in the animal kingdom. Wait, is he literally the great-grandfather of Franz de Waal? No, no, no. Oh, <laughs> I see. Speaking. I, you never but know. I, I, I mean, they're... you know, yeah. Kropotkin, not a <laughs> yeah. Dutch name, but I, I did um, Okay. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he was uh, basically uh, followed uh, around the globe by the Secret Service. And I think it's, it wasn't an acci accident that he, uh, you know, politically he was an anarchist. There's a real connection between his scientific work and his political views. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, uh, yeah. I, I would say you can, you can be an evolutionary psychologist and be very pro-egalitarian and very suspicious of centralized power w with very mm -hmm. good reason, I think. I mean, uh, m m my view of human nature suggests that you should be very wary about giving any politician a lot, a lot of power, A, and B – if we indeed evolved in hunter-gatherer societies, as I think it's pretty clear we did, uh, then situations of uh, tremendous material inequality are literally unnatural. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we couldn't cope with them, but it, but it's mm -hmm. important to understand that we we weren't. You shouldn't assume that that's going to work out well when mm -hmm. when you have uh, situations of great material inequality because mm -hmm. hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, especially the kind that, that would have existed before, say, you know, 20,000 years ago, uh, w would have been, um, you know, w would have been, uh, would have distributed material, you know, food and things, at least, uh, very, there wouldn't have been a lot of wealth in, in our sense of the word. So I, th I, I wouldn't, you know, anyway, I, th I think you can and there go was a, a strong lot of inequality aversion, actually. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, there are mechanisms the... for humbling the the arrogant uh, that yeah, you yeah. see in, on display in hunter gatherer yeah. societies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you are a great hunter and you've you know caught something like a deer or a gazelle or something, and you you come back to the camp, then what you have to do is say nothing, be silent, wait till yeah. someone comes up to you and says, "Well, did you catch something today?" And you say, "Well, no, nothing really." Uh, and then that person would know, you know, we're going to eat well tonight. Imagine yeah. Donald Trump in prehistory or in the Stone Age. Well, based on the evidence we have, he probably wouldn't have survived for long because people <laughs> don't really like One narcissists hopes. and sociopaths. And so, the, I mean, I think he would have been uh, expelled from the group and died alone, which is uh, an indictment of the society we've created, is that for a long time we had this process of survival of the friendliest, but now often it seems to be that we have survival of the shameless. We're actually the sociopaths. Uh, seem to have a, you know, a greater chance of rising to power. Seems truer than it was even uh, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, the technological landscape has changed in, in ways that I think we haven't caught up with. But um, so let me, you know, I agree that uh, we can we can become what we are told is natural or we can mm -hmm. use if we're told that it's natural, you know, to cheat on your spouse or to cheat somebody or whatever that can lead us to behave more like that and and, mm -hmm. and we should we should guard against that and emphasize that saying something's natural isn't to say it's good and isn't to say it's unchangeable mm -hmm. um at the same time i guess uh 
I, I, you know, I, I am constantly seeing myself in situations where I want to see it, say to people, you don't understand you're worse than you think you are, like in the following sense, like, right, well, r- let me ask you about the current situation in America, and, and, and maybe to some extent it, it applies to the Netherlands, but right now mm-hmm. America is famously in a period of polarization. Mm-hmm. And what is sometimes called tribalism, whether or not mm-hmm. you you like that term, we we know what is meant. Um, and what it looks like to among the things it seems to me to involve are like people. Um, okay, they define a group as the enemy, like uh, people in the resistance don't like Trump and don't like his supporters. Uh, mm-hmm. They first of all overgeneralize about the enemy, like all Trump supporters are racist or whatever they want to mm-hmm. say, or Trump supporters have their own um, overgeneralizations. And then, you know, the cognitive biases we know about, just for example, confirmation bias, and I could list others, kick in so that mm-hmm. once you've decided the other group is the enemy, you're, 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 you're noting evidence consistent with the thesis of their badness. Mm-hmm. And you're disregarding evidence of their goodness and you're not sharing that on social media. And sometimes you're not even seeing it because people mm-hmm. in your tribe aren't sharing it and so on. And these seem to be built in cognitive biases. There's a lot of evidence for that. They seem to be totally universal. Agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I, to me, it could help to explain to people, you know, in some respects, we are born bad in the sense that we have these cognitive biases that just distort our view of reality. These mm-hmm. are the same biases that get us into actual wars. And I want you to know that, um, you know, I, I, maybe I wouldn't go so far as to deliver a sermon on original sin. But yes, in some ways, the seeds of evil are in us and we yeah. have to guard against it. This may have something to do with the fact that I was brought up a Southern Baptist. Yeah, but yeah. No, I, 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 totally, I totally agree with you. You know, I think one of the dark truth about our species is that we often do the most horrible things in the name of loyalty and in the name of friendship and in the name of, you know, cooperation, doing something for our group. Uh, and this is true in an era of polarization in the US, but it's even true if you look at the psychology of suicide bombers. What you often, it's very hard to find a suicide bomber that just enjoys violence and is a sadist or something like that. It's also quite hard actually to fight suicide bombers who've been, are highly ideologically motivated and know everything about Islamist teachings. Often they know quite little about it and mm-hmm. they go to Syria with books like Quran for dummies in their backpack. But then you try to look at the psychological mechanisms that bring them to do such horrible things. And you discover that often it's a sense of comradeship and of, you know, wanting to do something for your people and your group and and your mm-hmm. very best friends. And that, that gives you this feeling of purpose and uh, something higher in life. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that is a, that is a dark truth about about our species. Um, if you sort of, again, go back to to the way we've lived for such a long time. I mean, obviously, most of the interactions we had were face-to-face interaction. We could look each other in the eye. We know that human beings have quite special eyes uh, compared to other primates. You know, there are 200 primate species in total. We're the only ones who clearly have white around our irises. So we've got these cooperative eyes. It's easy to follow each other gazes. We also have the unique ability to blush. There's some evidence that, what is it, like some parrots can blush as well? I was I wasn't fully convinced by by that when I saw it, but anyway, there there's some evidence. But isn't it fascinating that you know uh, we involuntarily give away our feelings to someone else uh, in order to establish trust, and that uh, all of us do that around the globe. Those in power don't tend to do it anymore, uh, but you know, average people do it. So I think that on a face to face basis, we've really been shaped by evolution to work together and to cooperate. But then obviously when we're not face-to-face anymore, when we're on Twitter, then you suddenly can do quite nasty things that you normally could never do. And the same is true in the history of warfare. It's very difficult to shove a bayonet down someone or through someone uh, after the Battle of the, so- of the Somme and the Battle of Water- Waterloo. Almost no of the wounds 
was later discovered, were caused by bayonets. Almost all, all of the casualties were from artillery. And that's because it's psychologically relatively easy to just push a button and kill a lot of people far away. Now, that's not, that's not, I'm not condoning anything here. It's obviously about trying to come up with an explanation. Uh, but yeah, that sort of could explain a little bit of, uh, of what's going on here. I think that distance plays a, a really mm-hmm. central role, both physical distance and psychological distance. And then so maybe the simple, simple, but actually very hard medicine we need here is contact, trying to put people in contact again. Yeah, although there there are a lot of examples of people, <clears throat> you know, kind of killing at close range and even killing people with whom they have contact. The key thing is mm-hmm. they have to first become convinced that the people are a threat. You know, mm-hmm. this this ethnic group is like stealing our women or something, or they're the ones mm-hmm. committing the robberies, or they're uh, doing this or that. I mean, you know, there have been. Uh, genocides, not just in the, in the kind of uh, particularly, uh, creepy form that the Holocaust assumed. And by that, mm-hmm. I mean the, the industrial kind, right? Where most, most Germans didn't have to see it happening. Mm-hmm. But there have also been, uh, genocides that involve more in the way of rampage and, 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 and the people, um, you know, doing the killing kind of knew what they were doing. So I guess what I'd add mm-hmm. to the contact uh, hypothesis is that it matters greatly whether you see your relationship with those people as zero sum or non zero sum. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, we've seen time and time again that if you view yourself as pursuing a common goal with people, mm-hmm. it's like if you see a fight break out in professional sports, mm-hmm. you know what lines the fight is going to break out. Along the key, de- mm-hmm. the key determinant of tribal affiliation is going to be the color of the jersey, not the color of the skin, because mm-hmm. the, the people on an integrated team have decided they're on the same team. Their goal is to beat the other team. Um, so I do think, you know, we need to try to um, create situations in which, uh, especially groups of potentially antagonistic people, have common goals mm-hmm. and see themselves mm-hmm. as having common goals, and of course. Politicians often try to convince us of the opposite. And, and yeah. right now, America yeah. has a president who's particularly adept at that. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I, I think it would be, uh, if we own, if we hope the contact alone will do it, we may not be using all the, uh, kind of ammunition we, we have. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, if that and and if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, contact theory is one of those <laughs> things that when you hear about it, you're like, does someone really need to do a PhD on that? I mean, obviously, that is a good thing for people to be in contact. But then again, everything is obvious once you know the answer. So uh, we have, you know, a, a quite a big body of evidence. Basically, it goes back all the way to the 1950s with psychologist Gordon Alport, who first come up, came up with the theory. Um, and now we have so much evidence that in so many different circumstances and institutions, it really helps if people have some diversity in their life. Uh, it just makes them more accepted uh, and tolerant towards differences. Now, that's easy to sort of uh, conclude and it's easy to understand, but to actually, you know, apply it in our societies is really hard, you know, to make our schools diverse enough, to make our institutions diverse enough, to make our democracies diverse enough. That's actually a really long ro- road mm-hmm. that you have to go down and, and it needs a lot of maintenance because it's very easy to go in the other direction again if you're not paying attention. Um, but it's just, I think it's one of those examples where an accurate view of human nature, a realistic view of human nature, where you just realize that yeah, we've evolved, we've evolved for face to face interaction and it's very hard. It's, it, it starts to become easier to hate someone else when, when that person is far mm-hmm. away. That has real and important implications for how we organize our schools and, um, uh, how we organize uh, the workplace. Um, it has real, yeah, implications for what kind of laws and procedures and regulations you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that it's harder to, um, it's harder to be mean. It's harder to say mean things to a person than about them. I mean, we actually discovered this. Uh, so this uh, video platform that this will run on. Well, it's a mm-hmm. it's a channel called Meaning of Life TV, but it's a sister channel of something I started 15 years ago 
mm-hmm. which is called bloggingheads.tv. And, and, and this was at the dawn of kind of internet video. Mm-hmm. And so one thing that was happening was we were, we would take bloggers who had, who had said critical things about each other. And then put them in conversation with one another. And in a way, it was disappointing because I was hoping for like more conflict. Uh, But, you know, they would. That never happens, does that? They would say like, (laughs) well, we'll just agree to disagree. And I'd be like, no, 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 disagree. That's, that's (laughs) better. Uh, but, but, um, you know, I've got one chapter in my book about the Stanford prison experiment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Why don't you remind people? Why don't you just quickly remind people what that is? It's a famous experiment, but, but go ahead. Yeah. So Philip Zimbardo, a psychologist, it was still quite young when he did this experiment in the, at the beginning of the 70s. And he had 24 students, uh, t- and he made 12 of them into guards and 12 into prisoners. And he put them in this fake prison in the basements of Stanford University. And the traditional story that's always told about this experiment and ended up uh, in all the psychology textbooks and was taught to millions of, of psychology students was that very quickly, these guards who called themselves pacifists, where these seem to be these very nice, friendly, liberal hippies, well, they turned into monsters and started to behave in a very sadistic and nasty way. Um, I used to believe that. I think I've written about it quite a few times in earlier books of mine that luckily have not been translated into English. Uh, but only recently, very recently, a French sociologist, uh, Thibault Texier, was the first one to go into the archives of the STEM for prison experiment. And he, well, he discovered that it's basically a hoax. I think there's really no other way to, to describe it. Uh, he discovered that actually Zimbardo had got the idea of, of doing an experiment like this from one of his undergraduate students, uh, who had, you know, done this sort of, a uh, thing in the house where you live with other students, sort of this, yeah, it's a, one of, like a crazy thing you do when you're when you're of that age. And he saw, he was like, oh, that sounds fantastic. Let's 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 do this again. And so he asked this this student to work with him, and um, then they specifically instructed the guards to behave as nasty and sadistic as possible because they were really interested in the response from the prisoners. That was mm-hmm. the initial thing that he was interested in and that he wanted to publish a study about. Well. Then, you know, uh, things uh, went downhill and, uh, you know, the experiment had to be canceled five or six days after it had started. And then uh, then he w- almost immediately went to the press and told this completely different story that, you know, on their own, these guards started to behave in a very nasty way. way. Well, in reality, many of them had said that they didn't want to do it. It was only when Simbardo uh, and his co-researchers said that they needed these results for the mm-hmm. study so that they can go to the press and say, look, prisons are horrible environments, that some of them went along with it. Now, what I think is interesting here is, and that's why uh, why I thought of it, is that um, the, the experiment was later sort of replicated by two British psychologists for the BBC. It's called the, the BBC Prison Experiment. Uh, this Alex Haslam and Steve Riker did this. Um, and they said to the BBC that, yes, they wanted to do this experiment. And the BBC obviously hoped for, you know, very sadistic behavior because that would be great for ratings. Uh, but then the, the psychologist said that they would go along, but that they wouldn't interfere. So that, you know, they really would have to leave the guards and the prisoners alone. And the BBC said yes. Now, that was a great mistake because, you know, it's the... I, I watched all the four episodes and I'll never get those hours back. It's like really, really boring. <laughs> Nothing happens. Uh, already in the first episode, one of the guards says, you know, we could just talk about this. And then in the last episode, they're all sitting together in the cantina playing cards and, and drinking tea. It's a really a terrible indictment of human nature is that this is what happens. It's so boring. <laughs> um, and now they yeah, were, they so were the- on camera through this and kind of knew they were on camera. Yeah. 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 That could so have been obviously. Things. I, I agree. I agree. And that that's obviously a criticism of this study. Now, St- Riker and Haslam say that they they believe that, you know, they really forgot about the cameras at some point. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it's it's interesting that in this case, pretty much the opposite happened and they couldn't really uh, get the guards to behave in a nasty way. There is an account. I wish I could remember who did it. He He's one of the two or three American hikers who uh straight into Iran and was uh, captive there for some period of time and then was released but anyway he he's a he's like a progressive guy and he mm-hmm. took a job as a as a a, a, a um a prison guard to mm-hmm. kind of see what it was like and i think in his account he was surprised 
by kind of how hard it was to not be mean to the prisoners. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it wasn't anything like the Stanford experiment. But I think, I mean, again, it kind of gets back to the point that if you put people in a totally zero sum situation, it's like, and say, look, these people are just, you know, you, you set things up so that all they can do is cause you trouble, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll get worse results. And, 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 and I think there is, uh, evidence that prisons don't, have to be set up that way. You know, there's one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, Can you, I say one thing about this? Yeah, sure. Robert? Because I think my the issue as a historian that I really have with these famous social psychology experiments like Stanford Prison Experiment or the Milgram Experiment is that they, to me, they seem to trivialize things like the Holocaust and other gen- genocides. Mm-hmm. They seem to suggest that, you know, you only need to change a couple of small things in people's circumstances and then boom, quickly the Nazi comes out in each and every one of us. That really seems to, to me that it trivializes the history of the Holocaust, which was an extraordinarily complex process that was years in the making. Uh, a very complicated process of dehumanization, of political pressures and circumstances and your name. I mean, libraries full of books have been r- written about it and that's been necessary because it is very hard to understand. And there are many different moving parts if you want to understand anything about it. And then so these psychology experiments that are just like, well, you know, you can just have an average person and you can find a Nazi camp guard in every, you know, average yeah. American city very easily. I don't know. That seems to me that it trivializes the whole thing. No, I would assume they had to be very selective about who the actual Nazi guards were, right? I mean, I would yeah. I would assume that's not a random sampling. I would like to think not a random sampling <laughs> of the German population. Um, on the other hand, the German, you know, population kind of went along with a lot of obvious uh, brutality toward Jews and other groups. Uh, yeah. it, you know, yeah. it needs explaining. I mean, it needs – I agree. It's something that happened and involved human beings. And, and yeah. my, see, I guess that's it. I guess my own view is – it is good for us to keep in mind that this could happen to any of us. Yes. You know, yes. um, America did inter Japanese Americans in World War II. If you mm-hmm. feel sufficiently threatened by a group, you will do things that, in retrospect, in a calmer state of mind, seem indefensible. And, yes. And uh, I guess that's... Uh, you know, the virtue I see of kind of emphasizing the dark side, although, I, I you know, I acknowledge the downside uh, 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 of uh, convincing people that it's uh, natural to be horrible. I, I, yeah. One know. of the powerful things about the Milgram experiment was obviously that people now, now, didn't now we should say Mil- this... Milgram is the one where uh, yeah. he set up a situation where people thought they were administering shocks to people who were actually Confederates and the Confederates would act like they were being hurt by the shocks. Yeah. And, and supposedly these people, if, if, if a guy in a white lab coat said, now amp up the shock to 10, these people would say, okay, sure. Uh, that, that, so it was an, it was a, a study in how, how <clears throat> authority could induce cruelty. Yes. And, and unlike the Stanford prison experiment, it has been replicated in other parts of the globe and, and quite, quite a few times. So I think there are real issues, big issues mm-hmm. actually with the Milgram experiment as well. The Gina Perry, the Australian psychologist, has written a great book about it uh, where she actually shows that a lot of the people didn't believe the situation was real. And that's why that many of them went along with it because mm-hmm. they're like, well, I'm in, the, I'm in the basement of Yale University. I'm, it's very unlikely that I'm killing someone here. <laughs> uh, um, and and he, she also showed that actually if – People believe the situation wasn't real, that they would go to a higher voltage. But then again, maybe it wasn't 65% as initially reported by Milgram. Maybe it was like 50 or 40 or 30%, but it's still way too high, right? You would expect that only, or you would hope that only like 1% of the population, like the true psychopaths would do something like that. But Mm -hmm. as you say, and I, I agree with you that it's good to be reminded that we are capable of this kind of behavior. Um, one of the most interesting things I think about the Milgram experiment is that, you know, people don't immediately get, go to 450 volts. They go from 15 to 30, from 30 to 45, from 45 to 60 volts. And this is the process that you see on a, on a, you know, on a macro scale in history so many times. It's the normalization of evil. You just get used to things that you weren't, mm-hmm. you, that you thought, you know, just five or 10 years ago that you, you thought that it would never happen. Now, my previous book, Utopia for Realists, which was about, you know, one of the ideas in there was basic income, was actually about how uh, really utopian ideas can be normalized. 
and that indeed six seven years ago i think basic income was a very obscure idea that almost no one was talking about it now i think it's really on the agenda and it's even recently in an editorial the financial times the world's leading business paper said that we probably need to consider it now that was six seven years ago was unimaginable but Mm -hmm. that can go in both directions and i think that what we've seen in the u.s is just uh i mean the metaphor of the shock machine is very powerful there and uh yeah, people are just getting used to yeah. things that they shouldn't get used to. So let's talk a little about universal basic income. Uh, first, I want to uh, share one of the stranger pieces of trivia in psychology, which is that <laughs> Zimbardo, who did the Stanford Prison Experiment, and Milgram, who did the the shock experiment, you know, those two mm-hmm. experiments routinely appear side by side in psychology textbooks. Mm-hmm. It turns out that Zimbardo and Milgram went to the same high school and were there yeah. at the same time. Uh-huh. That, that, I mean, in a country the size of America, that seems to me almost bizarre, but there yeah. it is. Um, Another crazy trivia is that Simbardo was also the guy who did a study at the end of the 60s that laid the ground for broken windows theory. So, uh, hmm. you know, the, the very hmm. influential theory in policing right. that led to basically arresting a lot of black people, uh, you know, for the smallest of infringements. And I that, didn't know that. I think played a big part in the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, uh, it's <laughs> history is full of bizarre coincidences. I was once at a conference with Zimbardo in Mexico, and it was something that had like a huge audience, like a couple mm-hmm. of thousand people. And I had done my thing. It, it, it went over a couple of days. And then I so then I was up in the audience. I, 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 I had like had a debate with like Hitchens and Sam Harris or something. And um, uh, and Zimbardo did this thing where he told everybody in the audience to get up and dance. And I just thought, like, is this... To me, it just seemed obvious, like, a demonstration of what, like, authority can do, like like some kind of meta thing. Mm-hmm. But everybody but me did it. I just... Uh, I refused. <laughs> but everybody, everybody... Pretty... 97%... 97% of the people... Daniel Dennett was next to me, and he, like, got up and danced. And I'm like, man... Uh, the whole well, point. If I, uh, if anyway. I would write a book about how people are fundamentally evil, I would start with that anecdote. Uh, that, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what? Ex- <laughs> I, apparently, we agree on dancing. Okay. So, um, <laughs> universal basic income. I mm-hmm. think by now most people know what it is. Here's my question about mm-hmm. it: Is like, uh, if you grant that it could make sense. I mean, part of the premise is, as it's commonly told, that we may be moving into a situation where automation makes it hard for a lot of people to get jobs and so on. But in mm-hmm. any event, if you grant that that a large chunk of the population is going to need the support, still, why give it to everyone? Because the standard scenario, right, is mm-hmm. like we give X amount per month to every American now. In my old-fashioned way of thinking, the money has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. My recommendation would be tax rich people. Don't give Mm -hmm. them money. Take money away from them right now. Like, (laughs) but, but, but the, the, the model is, I gather, you give it to everybody and then it comes from somewhere else or something. How does that work? Yes. There's a sociological argument to do it this way. Um, I think this paper was published by two Swedish economists or sociologists at the end of the 90s, where they show that actually the countries who have more universal programs of social security and of, you know, in the welfare state are better, are more effective at reducing poverty than those countries who have more targeted approaches. So the US and the UK have a much more targeted welfare state where it's really like, we're only going to support those who really need it. And we're not going to support say the middle class, you know, they don't need help in getting childcare or sending their kids to school because I mean, they have jobs, they can pay for that themselves. But it turns out that if you make the welfare state a bigger thing that, you know, you just get more support for it. And uh, then you have the support of also people who, yeah, just have more political power, who are better at lobbying for their own interests, and then the poor benefit from that as well. And I think this is one of the the reasons why you want a universal basic income. It will just be very, very hard to get rid of universal basic income because a vast majority of population will really, really like it. Uh, just as with the universal healthcare, I mean, you could make the same case there. Why do you need universal healthcare? You can also just only give it to people who can't afford it. But if you give it to everyone, 
it's it's more efficient. It's actually cheaper if you compare healthcare uh, systems around the globe. And it's very hard to get rid of. While with targeted systems, that's really easy to get rid of. You know, you only need to scapegoat a couple of recipients of benefits, you know, call them welfare queens or something like that. And mm-hmm. these people, you know, they can't, they can't resist. They don't have the lobbying power. They don't have the political power. Um, so, yeah, I think that it, on average, these universal systems are seen as much more um, legitimate. They enjoy a, a bigger support. Right. And I mean, this is one reason Social Security is given to everyone in America. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with Social Security, the idea, at least, whether or not this is true, is that actually they're giving you back money that you kind of accumulated via a payroll tax over your Mm -hmm. life and so on. Um, It just seems to me with universal basic income, it's more obviously the fact that you're actually lying to the upper income people because presumably the money is coming from them, right? You're, you're taxing them twice as much. So the, you know, and then giving them some of it back and giving some of it to somebody else. I mean, that, yeah. that in the yeah. long run it seems to me that it has to be a dynamic. I would just think, and you many know, many people wouldn't income, even notice a difference because they would get because a basic they're so income. Rich. Yeah. Well, no, they would get a basic income and they would get an additional, you know, the same increase in taxes. So it would be like, yeah, yeah, these things would cancel each other out. But I think that politically, philosophically, morally, there is a big difference because I would, I actually agree with Andrew Yang that you shouldn't call it a basic income, but a dividend, mm-hmm. uh, that it's really, it's, it's not about earning something. It's your right as a citizen of your country. And we afford it by uh, sharing the rents of, all the progress that we've already made. I mean, the reason that people are rich is not because they're individually special. Actually, individually, almost every person on this planet is really disappointing, is not very smart, is not very creative. It's it's just that we get these extraordinary tools and all this extraordinary wealth from other people around us and from earlier generations. And that has made us so rich. Individually, we're really not that special. I mean, we can't even win an uh, an intelligence test when we're competing with a pig uh, at two years old, right? Speak for yourself. Uh, oh, you mean when we're two? <laughs> when we're two? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, maybe maybe I could win now, but <laughs> um, I would bet on you. But b- but then but then uh, why have I become smarter than the pig? It's obviously because I've plagiarized a lot. And because I've learned so much from other people, plagiarism is is the essential thing that we do. Is we learn from others all all the time. And um, this well, sort actually, of cumulative I mean, culture. Not, but that's not the only reason you're smarter than a pig. People are smarter than pigs. Right? I mean, that's a result of evolution. I mean, an adult mm-hmm. human is, by virtue of genetic endowment, smarter than a pig. We agree about that, right? Well, we have we have bigger brains, but it is interesting that. Um, I mean, you have these intelligence tests, right, between human beings and, for example, chimpanzees or bonobos. or And then you've got some lovely videos on YouTube, uh, different tests. And then, you know, it's it's not clear at all that the toddler of two years old is smarter than... Well, no, uh, two years old, a, yeah, yeah, that's your point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But then obviously when, as we grow older, we get so much knowledge from the people around us. And that knowledge, well, uh, for example, I can count to 10. Very impressive. Mm -hmm. I know. But I mean, I doubt that I could come up, could have come up with a a numerical system of my own. That was just handed to me. Right. So uh, that's what I like about basic income. I think it recognizes that we actually deserve so little of our wealth. You know, so, so little of our wealth is actually a result of our own accomplishments. Almost everything we have is just, yeah, it was given to us. Uh, are all these great technologies, the inventions, the buildings that we live in. It's a product of human cooperation and it's our heritage. And I think basic income recognizes that and says, well, let's then just give everyone a monthly dividend. That is just uh, some venture capital so that everyone can make their own choices in their lives. It's not enough to live a life in luxury, but it is enough to start a new company, move to a different job. It's enough to give you genuine freedom. Yeah, I mean, I'd also say, uh, I mean, the, the general point, I don't know how to build a smartphone. I don't know how to create like the cereal I ate this morning. Uh, that, that, that's all true. It all, it, it's all, everything I enjoy is a result of vast collaboration that I mm-hmm. never see. That's all true. At, at the same time, there are some people who are more accomplished who think up more impressive things and so on. What I would emphasize is it's all a matter of luck in some sense. I mean, uh, yeah. Whether Einstein, whether it was a result of genetic endowment or cultural benefits, he was just 
wound up more deeply insightful than I could have ever been. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he was lucky to be born Einstein. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. And uh, so everybody should be humble about their achievements. I certainly agree. I, agree, that. I, agree. I well, think that uh, actually, there's this, the, the, all these philosophers who've written books against free will, right? Uh, I think Sam Harris wrote one as well. And, yeah. Yeah. But they they don't really take the argument to the logical conclusion, I think. Because if there really is no free will, and I think, I mean, the evidence is really clear. I mean, free will is a totally illogical concept. I mean, you can... You can always go back, I think, to and say there are always causal forces that may, make us do this or do that. And I mean, um, at least so much of our wealth is the product of our circumstances. Like 60% is the country in which we were born, 20% or 10% is our gender, 10% is our ethnicity, then, you know, the socioeconomic circumstances, then just pure accidents and luck, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is interesting. Robert Frank made this point is that uh, he was talking with an entrepreneur who said, yeah, but I took real risks and that's why I deserve this. And there you have it. He took risks. So, I mean, the the the, concept, the definition of risks is that it was a chance. So he was lucky. Right. Right? He was lucky. He was it lucky. Worked out well. Exactly. So if you're an entrepreneur who took risks and you're rich, now then you were lucky. Yeah. That's the whole idea. So um, I, I think it's interesting that these people don't really take it to the logical conclusion, which to me seems to be uh, that we need to be, live in a society that is as socialist as possible, which was, uh, you know, the, John Rawls said as well, is that – the only way to justify inequality is if you say, well, it's actually better for all of us if we live in an equal, an equal society because we have more economic growth or more technological innovation. But then the burden of proof is on you, right? You really need to show that indeed inequality is better than equality. And if not, then, you know, move in the socialist direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also interesting. I think a friend of mine is writing a book about this right now is that so often the language of free will of I did this, I, you know, I worked hard for this is used as a way to justify, to justify hierarchy and, and power differences. So it's a stick to beat people with. Yeah. Uh, while philosophically, I think it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I'm agnostic on the question of free will. There's a, there, uh, I mean, uh, but, but, but that aside, I just consider it kind of imponderable, particularly in light of mysteries like consciousness and quantum physics and stuff. But, but mm-hmm. I agree that, um, uh, people just, some people are born with huge advantages almost by definition. It's clearly the case that uh, saying I'm responsible for uh, – I, I mean successful people are almost by definition privileged in some sense or another is what I'd say. And um, I agree with that. Now, that's a uh, – uh, so it's not like they deserve uh, to have disproportionate benefits in some – deep philosophical sense, maybe. But there is the second question, which I think you alluded to, and that brings us back to human nature, which is, well, you know, is it or is it not the case that if you set up society such that everyone has gets plenty of stuff regardless of how much work they do, things will still work out well, right? Mm -hmm. That brings you back to the argument about human nature, and it's a different dimension of human nature than the one we've been discussing, largely. It's not about what leads to war. Mm -hmm. It's about how many people uh, will sit around doing opioids Mm -hmm. if you just send them a check every month, and and what will become of society if no one's doing the work, and so on. So, you know, we, uh, we at this point don't have time to get real deeply into that but but i guess this was part of the motivation uh, for your interest in in the subject of whether people are good or bad it's a different dimension of the question right yeah i noticed that there was a disconnect between my own advocacy of basic income and my own view of human nature i used to have a more cynical view of who we are as a species and i was i had written this book in which i you know talked about all this evidence uh so many uh, experiments ever since the 70s and the 80s where, you know, uh, governments or NGOs actually experimented with basic income and showed that, you know, it's quite effective. Healthcare costs go down, crime goes down, kids do better in school. So, you know, quite hopeful. And I think uh, at least gives you uh, an argument that, that says, you know, we should experiment with this more and we should experiment in this direction. But then I started promoting the book, going on a book tour, and found myself discussing human nature with people again and again after mm-hmm. 30 or 40 minutes of conversation. Um, because indeed, you can ask people, you know, you can ask a, full, a room full of people, um, what would you do with a basic income? 
and 95% or 99% of people would say, you know, I've got dreams, I've got ambitions. You can give that basic income to me. Don't worry about it. And then you ask, what will other people do with basic income? And many of them will say, oh, yeah, other people, you know, you know they'll probably waste it on alcohol or drugs or uh-huh. something like that. So um, indeed, um, universal basic income itself presupposes a more hopeful view of who we are. It presupposes the notion that deep down we're a creative species who want to contribute, who want to do something with our lives, that we have this powerful intrinsic motivation um, that we are just naturally curious, um, that we're a, a, a homo ludens, right, a, a playing species, that that is really central to to our existence. And, uh, yeah, so I realized that I had to go a little bit deeper, and that was one reason why I wrote this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, on this, I'm more agnostic, I'd say. I mean, I, I think incentives are real, and there are a lot of times where if you don't have to work as hard at a particular kind of thing, Mm-hmm. To put food on the table, you won't. And, I, and I'm sure you acknowledge that and say that, well, okay, but it may be that the kind of thing you're working so hard on is not, not so important anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, on the other hand, people are motivated by more than that. And they, they want to be, uh, they want to be thought of highly by the group they're in as mm-hmm. being, uh, you know, constructive members of the group. And they have, they do have creative impulse on. I honestly yeah. don't know what would happen. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, but, um, so I look forward mm-hmm. to, to seeing. Well, I, I do make the, uh, the maybe it's a bit of a cheeky argument, but even if I'm wrong, I think it would have beneficial effects if people would believe I'm right. Because again, <laughs> this is all about the self-fulfilling power of certain ideas. Um, psychologists have long known that intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation tend to cancel each other out. So if you have a society that... It relies more on the incentives of money and power and hierarchy, etc. Then people sort of lose their intrinsic motivation. They don't really know why they're doing a certain mm-hmm. kind of job or work anymore. And um, yeah, I think if you treat people as creative, as, as cooperative species, then they may actually become that kind of people. And then nowadays we do, if you zoom in on the welfare state, for example, we both in Europe and the US, we often do the opposite. If you want to have benefits, if you want a little bit of money from the government, you need to prove over and over again that you're sick enough, depressed enough, you're really a hopeless case, and then maybe you'll get a little bit of support. I mean, that's a system that produces dependency. And yeah. here, basic income is a way of turning that around and saying, I think you've got great ideas. I'm really curious to see what you'll come up with. And sure, there will be some, there will be some people who will waste it, but that's mm-hmm. just collateral damage that we should accept. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's leave it on that uh, inspiring note. I look forward to seeing what happens when Andrew Yang is elected president in 2024. <laughs> and you're, uh, just a matter of time, I think. <laughs> yeah. And you will, you will be his uh, chief policy consultant. And I'll be glad I, I'll be glad I know you. Um, so pe- it sounds utopian, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> or dystopian oh, to some. <laughs> excellent segue to another book plug. So Utopia for Realists, How We Can Build the Ideal World is a, uh, your earlier book where you, mm-hmm. you talk about uh, basic income, universal basic income, and also about open borders, something we don't have time to get into, but mm-hmm. but maybe, maybe can at a future time. Anyway, your latest book is uh, Humankind, A Hopeful History. Uh, thank you for thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. It was a real honor. I hope to see you down the road.